right. Thank you for coming, uh, everyone. I would like on, uh, only before we introduce ourselves and you'll hear more about the panelists today, I wanted to, take, uh, to thank my colleague, Theodora Dragustinova, who came up with the idea. It didn't uh, take her much to convince me and talk me into it, so I jumped on board and then we also recruited our other colleague, um, Jesse Labov, who is Skyping from Hungary. And I want to thank very much the Slavic Center and the Mechon Center for agreeing to host this event. And also to let you know that your lunch, although modest, is courtesy of the History Department, the Slavic Center, and the Department for Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures. Enjoy. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited uh, to be here with all of you and to be um, able to have uh, this discussion, this conversation about this very important topic. My name is uh, Theodora Dragustinova. I'm an associate professor uh, in the history department, and I work on questions of migration and minorities in Europe, the Cold War, communism, migration in Europe more generally. So for me, this is a terrific opportunity to try to integrate my own research questions into a very important current event and to truly show that humanities matter when we're going to talk about the contemporary world and about where we are headed uh, as a human civil civilization, if you wish. So what we're going to do, each one of us is going to try to talk um, uh, for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we're going to open it for a discussion. There will be a lot of uh, visuals. Uh, I don't have a prepared uh, talk to read, but rather I'm going to uh, walk you over some um, ideas and some um, basically observations that I have uh, on the, the issue, uh, and we'll finish with uh, uh, some very general remarks, and then uh, we'll see how we go from there. But for um, those of you uh, who are here, I will assume that you have been following the question of the refugee crisis in Europe in some detail, and I will skip the introductions how we got there just to remind you uh, that um, basically migration to Europe through the Mediterranean is not a new phenomenon. What is new in the last six months is the increasing use of the so-called East Mediterranean route. While for at least uh, seven to eight, maybe 10 years now, we have increasing numbers of people trying to cross into Europe using the Western and Central Mediterranean uh, routes, now with the um, Syrian civil war and with the influx of refugees from Syria, we see more and more people using the so-called Eastern Mediterranean route and therefore finding themselves crossing into the area of so-called Eastern Europe. I use this term as a blanket term, as a geographical term, if you wish to describe the area east of Germany and between Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, I'm not attaching any political meaning to this term right now, although we can also debate that. So uh, when we are observing what is happening in these areas affected by the most recent refugee crisis, there are two main themes, two main ideas that I have been uh, trying to deal with, to grapple with um, as I'm reading the news from the areas. One is the increasing propensity of pundits, of politicians, of ordinary people, of uh, people uh, commenting on the issue in social media, media to talk about the refugee crisis as a flood, as an invasion, as swarms of people who are besieging Europe. So this rhetoric is very wi widespread. It's not only in the media, it's also politicians who are using these sorts of, um, of vocabulary. They're talking about contagion. They're talking in one famous uh, case, you had actually a news um, channel talking about cockroaches coming to Europe and so forth. So this sort of rhetoric is very prevalent. Now, one of the reasons we see uh, these uh, uh, tropes uh, of thinking about the refugee uh, crisis is obviously uh, due to the anxieties uh, among many in Europe whether these refugees are totally compatible to the European civilization as such. So these are basically fears and anxieties of um, basically integration. Is integration going uh, to happen? Uh, uh, this is driving uh, many of uh, these uh, fears. And uh, what I really want to do is take those two ideas and talk and discuss how do those ideas play out specifically in the area of Eastern Europe. And uh, I do want to talk a little bit about what I understand Eastern Europe to mean. I am using it as, as a 
geographical area, uh, but also we need to remember that there are important distinctions within this broader area of Eastern Europe. First of all, there is the big distinction between those areas who are directly affected by the migration, where the main migration routes are going through, and there are other areas that are now fearing that, they, that they may get affected in the future. So most clearly we have, well, you see the areas marked in yellow here that are affected by migration, and then you have countries from Bulgaria to Hungary to Poland uh, to um, the Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, who are fearing that these refugees might start coming to them in larger number. You also have the crucial difference between those states who are part of the EU and who therefore have access to the resources available to them through the EU, and those states in the Western Balkans in particularly, who have been affected profoundly by the refugee crisis, who have now been actually declared safe areas for asylum-seeking purposes, but who are experiencing extremely difficult conditions because of their own extremely fragile socioeconomic and political situation. So I'm talking about cases such as Macedonia, which is at the forefront of the refugee crisis. Obviously, Serbia, who has dealt almost heroically with uh, the influx of uh, refugees in, uh, in their territory. You also have Kosovo and Bosnia who might get affected in the near, near future with the development of the situation. Uh, these countries that have been completely marginalized and impoverished by being ostracized from the EU accession process who are now really dealing with the bulk of this uh, crisis. So, uh, and one more uh, clarification. So this is in contrast uh, to the EU member states and actually what I'm really struck by is that some of the bigger complainers out there are not only EU member states, but they are also the countries that who are the least affected by the crisis, um, uh, such as, well, the rest of them from, uh, well, Hungary is a special case, we're going to hear about it, but we also have the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, uh, who are, you know, fearing this migration crisis, but they are yet to be affected in large numbers uh, by it. And one more caveat to throw in there, uh, here, and we can return to this, I mean, is the situation in Eastern Europe unique? Is Eastern Europe sort of like reacting differently to Western Europe to this crisis? We don't know yet. What, there are not studies out there comparing Eastern and Western Europe quite yet. We really cannot tell whether the, li the level of xenophobia in Eastern Europe is larger than in the West. I was really struck by this recent uh, actually uh, article in the Atlantic that seems to be claiming that if we actually compare tolerance levels uh, in uh, uh, Poland, Ukraine, and the Czech Republic, they're nearly the same as in Italy and Finland, whereas, uh, well, uh, clearly, uh, France is again the exception. Fr in France, xenophobia seems to be at a higher level than some of the Eastern European states. So to be talking about this as an Eastern European problem per se, it's also problematic, and we can return to that. Now, something that uh, uh, I think is more helpful to us when we are thinking about the current refugee crisis as related to Eastern Europe is um, the following question. What we are basically seeing with this refugee crisis evolving in the area is the painful transformation of Eastern Europe from an area of emigration predominantly, historically, over the last century or so, into an area of immigration. In the difficult ways that societies in these countries are dealing with this phenomenon. So to me, this is a more helpful way to think about the current question and to ask ourselves historically, when societies become immigration countries, immigration areas, how do uh, uh, this change affect the way they are functioning? To answer this question as a historian, I'm going to take you through some historical examples. I was particularly struck when the crisis was uh, uh, developing by the historical parallels. And what you see here on the left is an image from a, a railway, railway station in Macedonia, Gevgelia, uh, in June uh, or July of 2015. And what you see on the right is an image from exactly one century prior. This is actually the cover of my first book. And these are the Greeks in Bulgaria fleeing Bulgarian, actually the Greeks fleeing Bulgarian occupation after the Balkan Wars. So, I mean, I think that the historical parallels are there and actually histor using historical evidence to interrogate the current crisis is a very helpful way to think about what's new, what's unique, and what is actually a pattern that we can talk about rather than panic about the novelty of the event. Now, Eastern Europe has always been an area of vast population movements. That was particularly the case in the 19th century 
under the three great empires, the Russian Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, people moved around for all sorts of reasons. By the late 19th century, however, what you see is that the pattern of seasonal labor migrations that was part of the lifestyle of Eastern European societies became more permanent and spread to larger distances. So more and more Eastern Europeans were now going west, not only to the United States, but also to Western Europe. And the, with the arrival of these Eastern European newcomers to Western societies, you have very similar anxieties developed in these Western societies. Do we now have a Slavic invasion in Germany? Do we have, do we have a threat of colonization? Do we have uh, basically flood of Slavic immigrants trying to inundate the United States? So this whole rhetoric of invasion and floods was, re it was emerging again in these contexts as these Western societies were trying to grapple with the influx of, um, uh, of Eastern European laborers. Ironically, many of the same concerns and many of the same anxieties were visible after 1989 when labor migrations from Eastern Europe to the West resumed. And what you see is a very sustained rhetoric, again, of the Eastern European threat in Western European societies. You have, for example, the British government uh, paying for uh, advertisement campaigns, trying to convince the Eastern Europeans to stay in their own countries and not come and take uh, British jobs. And you can see one of these posters here. Sorry, the lifestyle you ordered is currently the Isles of Stoke. This is actually a poster sponsored by the British government to discourage migration of Eastern Europeans to the UK. And you have, in turn, Eastern European reactions such as uh, those campaigns by, um, uh, uh, in this case, the Romanian government, while saying, what is all? Half of our women look like Kate, the other half like her sister, right? I mean, you have uh, this uh, very um, uh, forceful, basically, reaction of Eastern European societies against what they perceive as xenophobic attitudes towards them. So that's one part of the issue. Uh, basically, you do see this um, society transforming from emigration into immigration societies. But Eastern Europe was not a newcomer in dealing with refugees either. E, e, just a century ago, Eastern Europe became the area of the largest refugee concentration as a result of the Balkan Wars and World War I fought on the Eastern Front. As some areas were affected by war for more than six contiguous, uh, continuous years, you see large numbers of people fleeing foreign administration, fleeing military conflict, to the point uh, to, uh, in, in which one historian basically talked about the process as a whole empire walking as a result of war, World War I on the Eastern Front, people trying to flee different national administrations, different hostilities, different military uh, 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 conflicts. That uh, period of instability continued in the interwar period when more and more refugees started actually coming to some of the defeated countries such as Hungary and Bulgaria, but also in the aftermath of World War I, forced population movements continued, and you do have one of the largest forced population movements implemented during this time period through the compulsory population exchange between Greece and Turkey enacted in 1923, which affected up to two million refugees, up to uh, two million people who are now uh, forced to move uh, from one country to the other. And it was after the, fi the fire um, uh, spread in the port city of Izmir, Smyrna, uh, ironically, now one of the major points uh, that current refugees use to come to Europe, that many of these refugee flows developed. And you can see some of these dramatic images of people trying to cross, well, the Mediterranean on flimsy boats, trying to walk tracks of land, trying to reach safety in an unknown land. And the process of integration of those refugees wasn't fast, wasn't easy either. What you can see here is Greek Orthodox refugees being accommodated in very, in very ad hoc ways uh, on the um, outskirts uh, of Athens. Uh, actually, this is uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, social group. I think it's actually Salonika on the left. And then you see uh, just under the Acropolis, right, uh, in Athens, you have uh, attempts to accommodate some of these refugees. And I have to think, that people in Greece and Turkey who are dealing with the refugee crisis today have to be thinking about these historical uh, precedents, about these historical parallels and examples, um, uh, uh, or one might hope so. 
what was um, also clear is that these refugees were greeted with hostility by the locals, even though they belong to the same religion, even though that they belong to the same presumed ethnic group. There was still, um, their integration lagged behind. It took them two generations, if not three generations, to incorporate. That was the case also in Bulgaria and Greece, which also experienced uh, ras large refugee waves during this uh, time period. And where actually the social, econ the slow social economic integration of the refugees really contributed to the political radicalism in the in both countries and determined the way they entered World War II. So the presence of those refugees, disenchanted refugees, was very important in the way they made the, their choices for participation in World War II as well. So you see the clear link between um, insufficient social economic. Um, um, integration of marginalized, marginalized groups and political radicalism, which is again something that we should think about in the current uh, crisis. Now, when we talk about World War II, obviously that was the time period when we have the most uh, drastic population movements, forced population movements. During the war, it's estimated that we have um, close to 30 million people on the move. The combined wartime and post-war forced migrations reached the figure, the staggering figure of 64 million Europeans displaced at some point during the war due to conflict. So this is sort of like uh, what we need to take into account when we are talking, when we're comparing, and we, when we are talking about the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Even if we assume that today we have one million refugees, we are not even close to what World War II uh, did to the European continent. So to be comparing the current refugee crisis to World War II is a little bit disingenuous given the very different uh, context that obviously the current refugee crisis is developing in and what was happening in Europe during World War II. Very briefly, uh, the most um, um, dramatic development uh, during this time period was obviously the deportations of the Jewish populations and their ultimate extermination. And we also have to think about that, we, what we're thinking when we're thinking about uh, refugee policies today, what happens if we don't evacuate people? What happens if we don't provide safety to people? And this is very much at the forefront of the thinking of German politicians. But <coughs> also, as far as Eastern Europe is concerned, is the whole issue of Eastern European complicity in, uh, in the Holocaust, in the removal of the Jewish populations, in the extermination of six million people. And there are all these debates in the literature how much were Eastern Europeans responsible for the extermination of their Jewish populations? But also the larger question, how do Eastern European societies deal with their national minorities? How do they deal with uh, ethnic, religious, national diversity and heterogeneity? And when we have today people in responsible political uh, positions saying, well, uh, Poland or the Czech Republic have no experience with diversity of any sort. They also have to think about this historical legacy and they cannot keep just going back to their own status as victims in World War II. Just keep reminding the world that, well, in Poland, yes, you do have the forced population movements. Yes, you do have the forced laborers and so forth. Uh, uh, you have um, uh, uh, obviously the local population suffering under the, the war, but also the responsibility of the local population has to be taken into uh, account. Uh, and then finally, uh, very quickly, many of these perceptions of Eastern Europe as a victim actually became um, part of the way of thinking of uh, Eastern Europeans during the Cold War, uh, when uh, the, e the uh, limited travel opportunities, the tighter border controls, this idea of Eastern Europe under captivity, in captivity, living in captivity, behind the Iron Curtain, contributed uh, and uh, sort of like crystallized many uh, of these ideas. And we can return to this question and we can talk, I mean, so uh, is it actually helpful to think about Eastern European, Eastern Europe today uh, as uh, uh, basically the heir uh, of the Soviet bloc? And does this explain anything in the way Eastern European societies today handle the current refugee uh, crisis? Because in contrast, during the same time period, you clearly have the transformation of Western Europe into a multicultural society with the influx of more laborers uh, uh, coming from, po from uh, you know, post-colonial um, uh, societies, uh, coming invited uh, through labor agreements uh, to work in Western Europe, whereas in Eastern Europe, 
this process did not begin uh, until uh, much uh, later. But the end of communism also brought war again uh, to the area. With the Yugoslav wars, uh, we see the huge displacement of people again. Uh, up to 2.7 refugees and internally displaced, person, uh, internally displaced person, persons were the product of the Yugoslav wars. And we, if we actually look at this graph that is showing us where these refugees went in Europe, we are going to see many patterns that we are seeing today with the Syrian refugees arriving in Europe. The largest part of these refugees went to Germany. Uh, uh, refugees tended to want to go to more economically secure societies, but also the response of the European uh, um, uh, government to the um, Yugoslav crisis was equally inconsistent and erratic as it is today. So perhaps we need to revisit uh, this time period and talk what lessons we can learn from the accommodation of the refugees. So if I'm to wrap up everything here, what I just want to emphasize briefly is two ideas. If we examine the historical evidence, we are going to see very clear that it is not possible for us to talk about migration as invasion because migration flows are always structurally determined. They are, uh, they are the result of larger patterns, of larger historical processes that have their explanation that they're usually time bounded and uh, geographically bounded. And this is what we're dealing with right now. If there is war, people will flee. That is clear. However, we also have to be very careful because um, we cannot really clearly tell apart refugees from immigrants. One of the fears now is these are not really refugees. Many of them are immigrants and they're coming under the pretext of war. But also historical evidence shows us that it's very very difficult to distinguish who is a refugee and who is an immigrant, and these determinations have really to be made on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, basis. Uh, and uh, generally what we see is that historically, refugees uh, tend to go to the countries with most favorable economic conditions. This is happening today, and this is a historical pattern. Historically, we also see large return waves of people who after the pacification of the situation in their, in their countries, we, we always have large return migration waves. This is happening, even continues to happen, although it is a, com it is a problematic process in the, Yugoslav, in the Yugoslav case. You have European countries encouraging uh, refugees to return, right? I mean, and we have this uh, historically speaking, but this is tied to the process of integration. And we have to understand that integration is a long-term process spanning two, three generations it always is, it always will be. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and there are always tensions between those who come, the newcomers and the local populations, even if they belong to the same religion, even if they belong to the same ethnic group, there always will be these tensions. I have some other thoughts, but I'm going to leave it for the discussion because I'm over my time. So I'm going to wrap up here and I will I'll let my colleague uh, Jana speak. Thank you. I'm Jana Hashamova and I'm professor of Slavic studies. My research interests uh, revolve around cultural constructs of um, gender, national, ethnic, and religious identities, mostly represented in media and film. And part of this is also related to what I'm doing. Uh, my most recent work is on human trafficking and media. Um, and the second half of my uh, presentation today, I will uh, touch on this as well. So I will be talking and picking up on some of the points Theodora made, um, and I will be talking on the news and the way the news uh, uh, covered the refugee crisis. For the last few months, I have followed a few uh, news uh, outlets and you have them there, BBC, Euronews, CNN to a lesser uh, degree, Slovenski Novice, that's a local um, Slovenian news and available online, uh, Bulgarian TV station also available online, BTV and uh, News BG, another Bulgarian um, news source. And my framework here, I'll go over my framework um, quickly, it has been um, proved and studied that news uh, is always a commodity. 
um, it is something to be sold and circulated. Um, and of course, it is also uh, closely tied to ideo ideology. Um, rarely or never there is uh, objective news, only detailing facts. News is always ideologically framed one way or another, and um, we will see this here with my presentation. The genre that I have discovered that is used mostly in this uh, coverage is the news bulletin, which is endlessly updating the events with no analysis and um, synthesis, basically uh, repeating all over and over again how many more thousands today or the day before compared to the previous week and this time on this island rather than on another island and again how difficult it is for the local authorities to deal with the situation. What I have noticed in, in my analysis of these sources and their coverage of the refugee crisis is differences in the reporting of the refugee um, crisis between West Western media and local South uh, European media. As in my view, Western media reverts to the old uh, stereotypes and patterns of uh, constructing East European countries as backward, uh, lacking civility, incapable of um, compassion and uh, human touch, incapable of managing and handling those crises which is actually an old construction. It is a, a European construction of uh, Eastern Europe as a region that is backward and that dates to the 18th century and there is scholarship done on this. Um, and also the Balkans in this case, um, there is the seminal uh, work of Maria Todorova called Imagining the Balkans. Again, through 17th and 18th century travelogues, the Balkans were already framed as this the, the backward, the backyard of, of Europe, the uncivilized um, area, because geographically it is still Europe. Um, the methods through which this construction was being done in Western media is through the process of selection, what exactly uh, news is being reported. There is a, s a selection of material um, and facts, omission of other material and facts, narrative framing and uh, visual representation. And again, BBC, CNN and Euronews sensationalize their reports, focusing on the refugees' unbearable conditions, but also on the xenophobic and intolerant East European peoples. Local media, in turn, try to show the impasse of the situation, their difficulties with which they deal with the crisis and what they found uh, at uh, on their hands um, uh, and also uh, try to project a bit the and blame Europe and the European Union for the its, um, as Theodora uh, called it, er erratic uh, policies and, and actions or and total failure of coherent policy on the crisis. And I want to emphasize here that while there is no doubt that local responses has failed thousands of refugees and it's flawed and we cannot deny that, um, I want to um, emphasize and, and make sure I get this point across that Western media has focused only on the brutality and the suffering uh, of the refugees with no interest in showing the complexities of the crisis um, and also I with no interest in exposing the failures of the European Union. Oh, uh, they are not denied, they are not hidden, they are mentioned here and there, but compared to the volume of just presenting the suffering of the people and their misery, it's uh, really there is no comparison. So I will start with just the, the yesterday's news, old constructs in play at play and again you will see that all of a sudden the, the uh, crisis which first was um, actually defined as West Balkan crisis without again mentioning that it is all European crisis uh, and the crisis of the European Union with its um, failures of security policies and foreign uh, policies, it became a Balkan crisis. Again. At this point, there is no crisis in Bulgaria or in Romania, but 
nonetheless, it is called the Balkan crisis. It's very easy to uh, adopt these old um, stereotypes. Scholars argued uh, at pains for the last 15 years, especially Balkan studies uh, scholars, that the Yugoslav wars of the 90s was not Balkan wars. It was Yugoslav wars because, again, there was no war in Greece, there was no war in Bulgaria, there was no war in Romania. And here we see the same thing. It became a, a Balkan crisis. Uh, so that's just from yesterday. Um, you see sensationalizing, um, and that's sensational images, but very shallow information. Uh, and this is a CNN, as you can see, report from uh, October 23rd. These images are not telling too much, are they? And the story is not telling too much. But they evoke sympathy, grab attention. I mean, really, couldn't they find some other images there to post? Um, one can go in details analyzing uh, the shots and the color and everything that uh, is, is in there. But I think they're pretty significant in the way these uh, reports and this refugee crisis has been covered. Um, what I also saw is double bind news, meaning on the one hand, um, these news uh, outlets like BBC and Euronews try to call attention to the difficulties and as I said, the, the misery, the impossible situation of these refugees and uh, hopefully uh, engage activists or engage governments and politicians to act <coughs> more uh, quickly and responsibly to solve this crisis. But on the other hand, in the process of doing that, they are again um, um, constructing Eastern Europe as this backward, impossible place where they cannot manage anything and, and they are all xenophobic and uh, intolerant. There are examples of couple of news, refugees stranded, sleeping between Austria and Slovenia, and this is the only report. As I mentioned, the genre is um, bu news bulletin. Uh, this is the whole article. Many people are having to spend the night at a border crossing between Slovenia and Austria. Those attempting to cross from Slovenia to Austria as part of an immigration to Europe are having to sleep outside. Ibrahim from Aleppo in Syria uh, said, he had been told he would be leaving, but it is yet to. So, well, yeah, they're in the, it's, these places cannot manage the, the influx. They cannot process all these people and they cannot uh, leave on time. This is clear for everyone. So why is that? And this is a repeated reporting like that. People are still stranded. People are living in, in muds, people in the, in the muddy fields now. Balkan winter is coming. Um, but again, there is no more information or why is that? Is it an only failure of this local government or is it something more than that? Mind you, there are very few, and I will go to that at the end, very few reports, if um, uh, very minimal, I've read only two, uh, establishing a connection between the European foreign policies and its intervention of the Middle East and the whole crisis. So this is not mentioned anywhere in the uh, regular reporting. <coughs> Exposing the European in Union as part of the reason for this crisis. Uh, Euronews again, the Macedonian authorities manhandle refugees and another Euronews report, the Czech police marking refugees directly on their skin. Um, another very clear uh, association and allusion with the Holocaust um, and the experience uh, of the Jewish population during the Holocaust, um, no, and, and they are not making it up. This really happened, but how is that helping? Um, and at the same time, there are fewer reports on Pegida, right? And Pegida is this nationalist Nazi uh, movement I in Germany against the refugees, picking up force in the last year. Um, just on Saturday, they celebrated one year anniversary of their creation and establishment in Dresden, and there were thousands and thousands uh, demonstrating with uh, uh, posters of Angela Merkel as a Hitler and saying Merkel has to go, no refugees, Germany for uh, Germans, the usual, right? Um, Nazi rhetoric. 
but neither BBC nor uh, Euronews picked up on that. And it was only Deutsche Welle which reported on that resurgence of xenophobia in Germany. So while we are reporting a lot on the Czech Republic intolerance and the Hungary and uh, uh, the Macedonia brutalities, uh, somehow we are um, omitting to report with the same force the nationalist um, insurgents and movement in Western Europe. And then I'll uh, move to the local news. There we uh, see uh, attempts at uh, presenting or uh, showing this uh, crisis and the response of local governments in, uh, with a positive spin, or at least showing their effort um, at combating the problems or dealing with the problems. This is an article from um, the Bulgarian news uh, source and I have translated it. They talk about catching smugglers. Um, the cases in Bulgaria are very um, isolated, at this point just in the hundreds, um, and they are um, crossing illegally the border with the help of smugglers from Turkey to uh, Bulgaria and from there to Serbia and trying to move on. Some of them are caught and um, um, registered in local centers this particular article reported on those who um, left the local center, hired the smuggler and decided to move on to, um, to Serbia, again seeking to reach uh, Germany or um, Sweden. There was another incident uh, recently at the Bulgarian-Turkish uh, border. Again, a group of these young um, uh, refugees were uh, smuggled through the border and a Bulgarian border patrol, um, as the, the reports say, uh, shot a warning shot in the air which ricocheted from a bridge and killed one of the uh, young men. They were the age between 20 and, and 30, about 50, 60 of them. Um, and what was interesting after this uh, incident is that there were there were groups of people asking for the um, um, punishment, legal procedure of that uh, border uh, uh, patrol. Uh, there were others uh, defending his actions and it became very hot topic uh, in blogs um, and regular citizens um, got engaged with that. Uh, as a result of it, there is a proposal to actually introduce a law um, limiting all uh, border patrols in, in their guns or weapons, the first bullet to be only a rubber bullet, um, whether that's helpful or not, but at least there is a healthy debate about it and there is this 15-minute uh, analysis that actually a very critical position of this expert here um, on the, the, this particular incident and some suggestions of how it can be improved. Um, I will move to the uh, Slovenian, uh, again, reporting of the news, uh, trying to pick up on, on um, kind of happy stories, at least stories that have some positive outcome. There is a family of um, uh, young um, Syrian couple uh, and uh, the parents lost their five-year-old daughter in the, in the process and with the help of the Slovene and uh, Croatian police forces, they located her and uh, reunited the family with um, their daughter. So again, that news never uh, comes in Western media. There is another one um, and again, there is a, a picture you always see, and Theodora showed you some uh, some coverage in images. They are always the, the children up front, um, of course, in poor clothing, crying. You see them uh, truly suffering. Here, unlike that coverage, here you have a rather orderly camp, as you can see the, the uh, tents. There are uh, makeshift uh, sinks and portable uh, toilets. Again, you can never see that type of image in Western media reporting on the local events. 
local authorities and local media is trying to show um, their efforts of, of dealing with the situation they have at their hands in a more positive way rather than, uh, I guess, uh, dwelling only on the, on the difficulties and the failures. Um, and now I will switch to one uh, true misinformation and very unfortunate misinformation that the media uh, perpetuates, and this is not even um, just constructing Eastern Europe or the Balkans or these uncivilized xenophobic geno areas in the, uh, of, the, of Europe, uh, but truly misinforming the viewer and the reader, which um, could have long-term negative effects on the refugees. And this is the uh, wrong use of the term traffickers and um, the terms traffickers and smugglers. These are um, West European media, mostly BBC and Euronews, tend to use, refer traffickers rather than uh, smugglers. And I uh, quoted a couple of articles here talking about smugglers. CNN actually uses it interchangeably, both traffickers and smugglers in the title. There was traffickers. When you start reading the article, they talk about smugglers. Um, Slovenian and Bulgarian media sources tend to write about smugglers rather than traffickers, unless they translate uh, EU news or BBC news, which uh, sometimes happens. And again, I quoted a couple of articles. One is, the first one is a uh, Slovene source, and uh, the smugglers there is Tito Tapci, and here the article talks how the smugglers are enjoying, were enjoying the, the um, good fall weather for their loads and now are fearing that the winter comes and they will, uh, their work will be uh, more limited. And the Bulgarian also two sources, two articles um, talking about cop smugglers in Bulgaria. Um, trafficking in human beings and smuggling of human beings are two distinct notions. They have different international um, understanding um, definitions they are criminalized differently, and the victims of trafficking and smuggling receive very different assistance and services in the countries. So um, it is important actually to distinguish those um, terms. And I will spend some uh, brief time here explaining what the differences are. The Human Rights uh, Watch talks about consent exploitation and transnationality, and these are the differences between human trafficking and um, smuggling as consent exploitation and uh, transnationality. Consent and transnationality is very typical for smuggling, uh, whereas exploitation is typical for trafficking. U.S. Department, there are two different definitions of that um, related or um, related attached to the uh, UN um, convention and UN initiatives of um, anti-criminal uh, organizations. Both are uh, Palermo protocols. One is the Palermo protocol on trafficking definition and another one is on the smuggling definition and both are internationally accepted. 168 countries have uh, ratified those, defi those definitions and they follow actually their legal uh, system uh, is adapted to the differences between these uh, this, um, processes and, and definitions. The U.S. Department also distinguishes um, the two. It lists the following ways in which the two are distinct. Trafficked persons are victims of a crime, while smuggled persons are complicit in the crime of smuggling. Victims of trafficking are typically enslaved or restricted from moving freely, while smuggled migrants are not. Smuggling requires the transportation of the smuggled persons, while trafficking may not involve moving them in internally or externally. Victims of trafficking, in order for exploitation to occur, must be working, whether in the sex trade or in heavy labor, while smuggled persons need not be working at all. So there is really a, a, a clear uh, difference, at least in the definitions. Now, what is happening um, on the ground, and especially with the refugees crisis, is that 
there is some overlap and because of the increased um, now migration um, limitation policies that Europe is trying to introduce, restricted migration, restricted movement policies, there is a, a, a danger that there will be an overlap between um, smuggling and trafficking while people are very vulnerable in the situation at the hands of the smugglers, they can be, um, the smuggler can turn a actually into a trafficker and start exploiting them and abusing them. So there is a distinct uh, danger and local NGOs in the Balkans actually plead uh, with the government and with EU. Uh, they have prepared a common report asking to rethink those um, uh, strict definitions and borders, especially in the context of this crisis, because again, the survivors or the victims of smuggling and trafficking need uh, special protection, but the laws uh, need to be uh, more uh, accommodating the current situation rather than the way they are functioning right now. Um, so I more or less explained that there are some similarities and overlaps. Um, here, what's uh, important to carry away is that the media reveals its ignorance related to the two terms that can bring further damage to the migrants when they are to receive services and to be identified as victims of trafficking or smuggling. So that's a, a, a clear misinformation that the media is perpetuating. And I am uh, at my conclusions of the brief examples that I offered you. Um, they are mostly from the last few weeks, but I have followed the weeks, the news as I told you for the last few months. There is no analysis of the reasons for the crisis and especially the EU's responsibility for it. No interest in exposing EU's incons inconsistent and inadequate security and foreign policies or as uh, Anne Applebaum, and that's one of the few um, um, analytic reports in the Washington Post, describe them, the EU's multi layered hypocrisy. South and Central East Europe, Europe's uh, scarce resources and difficulties in controlling the process notwithstanding, Central European states receive unfavorable coverage compared to West European states and their participation in the process. Viewers are emotionally engaged but poorly informed. Thank you. correspondent from the Budapest desk of the Slavic Center and the Slavic Department, but I should also mention that I am an associate professor in the Slavic Department. Um, I work in the region between Poland and Yugoslavia, loosely speaking. I usually focus on literature, culture, political philosophy, and intellectual history. And in this case, I'm giving you a series of impressions of what it's been like to live in this region over the last couple months during this refugee crisis. Uh, is this PowerPoint on the first, the opening slide? Yes. Okay, so just leave it there for a second. Um, to give you a preview of what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to focus on Hungary, although I'm happy to talk more about the other countries farther to the north and west of here in the um, Q&A if there's time. But I'm going to try to provide some context for the Hungarian government actions this summer and give a short prehistory of Orban's relationship with the EU so that I can then try to address his remarks about the defense of quote-unquote Christian Europe um, and discuss the general failure of EU-endorsed policies to support multiculturalism in the region. I'm going to talk briefly about the ongoing grassroots efforts uh, to provide some humanitarian aid to refugees in the absence of state support. And time permitting, I'm going to try to analyze key images that I believe really exemplify the in Hungary and what we can learn um, from the media representations of this crisis. So if we go to the first slide, um, I don't know how many of you have been following uh, developments in Europe over the last five or six years, but I'm just going to take us back a bit to the moment soon after Viktor Orban's Fidesz party came to power in Hungary in 2010, they were almost immediately critiqued. 
Kate's First Green Party uh, offering a protest in Parliament for their drastic restructuring of state and agency and the legislation that governs it. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see Orban here speaking just a year later and, and in, at the European Parliament again, uh, despite repeated condemnation of his new policies on the pan-European level. Uh, he discovers that his stubborn refusal to play Europe correctly works in his favor domestically. So with every new standoff in Brussels, his poll numbers rise at home over the years 2011, 12, 13, 14, particularly on the center right and far right, but not exclusively. So let's go forward one slide. Uh, here's a quote. I don't think that our European membership precludes us from building an illiberal new state based on national foundations. As you can see, this is kind of an open air, folksy uh, coalition of conservative and right wing parties in Hungary. This is where he chooses to bring the word illiberal into the discussion for the first time in 2014. People might say that Orban's views are evolving. I wouldn't. I would say they're changing. <laughs> um, but what we see here is that he's now addressing European Union membership as a conditional issue, which he hadn't done before. And if we go to the next slide, getting it all the way to yesterday, um, this is the background for a statement he makes like Christian Europe can only be defended if we don't let them in. And he's referring, in this case, uh, to the refugees coming from the Middle East. This interview on Spanish TV is actually the night before he gives a big speech, just as last Friday, um, to a group of conservative parties in Madrid last Friday. So I just want to point out that over those last five years, his recalcitrance led him to be more popular in Hungary. Over the last six months, his recalcitrance has led him to be more popular across Europe. He's actually a rock star now in conservative circles. So this might help us explain how both Orban and Fidesz, his party, next slide, um, have positioned themselves as both Christian defenders, defenders of Europe and rebels against the EU generally. That's tricky, right? How do you do that? You belong to e Europe, but not the EU exactly. So next slide. I'm going to bring us back to 2009 again quickly to take it and look at this image. It's from a Jobbik poster. Uh, Jobbik is a notorious right-wing party in Hungary, if you don't know, from 2009. This is really the beginnings of Jobbik's pop popularity, and it features iPod. Uh, that's the gentleman with the pointy hat. He's the fiercest of seven Hungarian chieftains who joined forces to create the foundation for the Hungarian kingdom in the late ninth century. That's not a typo, that's not 19th, the ninth century. So we're talking a thousand years old. In this image, he says at the top, I'm, let's conquer Europe again. He's ready to conquer Europe again by joining the EU parliament. And he's facing westward, presumably, and gives this speech below, which I won't bother to translate now, but uh, to Jobbik supporters about how they can help him take back Europe. So Jobbik at this time was significantly farther to the right than Fidesz was back in 2009. And there's still some tension between them, but what's happened since then is Orban successfully reined them in towards the center and more or less co-opted the populist side of their message. So next slide. This image is from this past June. It's a kind of a, it was a meme circulating around um, Hungary, what can we do with this 19th century painting of, again, Arpad and his chieftains in the 9th century. And it offers a very different view from Hungary. These are the defenders of Europe. It's kind of, an, it's the, the tag on this one is, y'all can't come in this way. It's kind of a, got a rural tinge to it in Hungarian. Now they're facing, we imagine, east, denying entry with the help of this rather gentle looking prince. Uh, they have assumed a position of defenders of Christian Europe from Islamic threat, as interpreted by Orban. And it doesn't just go back to the 9th century, of course. All of the centuries of resistance to the East that followed are also, I think, encapsulated in this image. And this image was, this particular one, was intended as a parody of that stance. And it was created in June when the discussion of the fence was more of a virtual debate than a humanitarian crisis. However, the absurdity of this image and the discussion of this border holds a very special resonance for Hungarians. And throughout the summer, images of more sinister razor wire fences abounded, both geographically, uh, the next image should be a map, if I'm in the same place you are. Yeah, it's a pretty familiar map at this point. The maps of the border, and visually of maps of the fence. The Hungarian borders with Slovakia, Ukraine, 
between Romania, Serbia, and Croatia, I will remind you, are all still open wounds in the populist, nationalist, and imaginary. They refer palimpsestically to the political limit of the country in the present, as well as its traumatic dismembering in 1920 after the Treaty of Trianon in the past, as well as the right seemingly irredentist aspirations in the future. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, razor wire. The suturing of the southern border with razor wire, and now the sealing of the Croatian border as well, does not cauterize these wounds or satisfy these aspirations in any way. Rather, it continually aggravates and reminds Hungarians of the open wounded border. So for those in the Hungarian opposition, the fences and the trains evoke both this scenario, 1920, uh, Trianon, uh, but sorry, a different memory, the shame of the Hungarian fascist past, which Theodora made reference to, the way that a lot of these images and a lot of the the sensationalism around these images actually um, features into the conversation in the present. So the next slide is the cover of Modras Not Orange. It's a left-leaning progressive weekly, and uh, the, the tagline reads, dishonor to the country, as if he's brought, Orban has brought dishonor to the country. Uh, now, layering this razor wire image along with um, its fascist implications, and of course, some have taken the train images in the same direction to refer to the uh, deportation of Jews during World War II. And to remind Hungarians of their very different subject positions as uh, members of the fascist Axis power during World War II, or, uh, next slide please, refugees themselves. So this comes up a bit in the oppositional representations of what's happening. This is an image um, from 1920. Uh, Theodore also mentioned this the wave of migration that came through the region um, in the wake, in this case, of Trianon, but also of the Balkan Wars. And these are people that are called the Vagonlafok, people living in wagons, that live at Kelepi, that same train station that was um, full of refugees this summer, for almost two years, because they had nowhere to go. They were being resettled from parts of former, parts of other parts of Europe. I want to bring us back to the present. And the next slide, we have a trumpeter. Do we have a trumpeter? Good. Good. Trumpeter. So today, images of men behind fences can resonate in different ways for those at different ends of the political spectrum. This image was taken by a photojournalist for a local paper in southern Hungary and was interpreted in two very different ways. It was initially taken up by the progressive left, who celebrated it as a humanizing representation. And I think I first saw it on the Edmilio uh, website with a blog that said, uh, young Syrians at the fence, at home they go to university and study architecture and computer science. So uh, this young man with the trumpet is a sign of quote unquote civilization farther to the east. Okay, not so for another wing of social media. This same image had a second life, particularly fueled by angry comparisons between Roma so let Roma like as in not Roma refugees, Roma in Hungary. Why is that? Well, the trumpet here happened to signify a different lifestyle for those on the right, not of acculturated upper class, uh, upper middle class aspirations, but of Roma musicians determined by populist understanding anyway, to remain on the margin of society. So here's another way in which the refugee crisis and particularly representations of it like this have triggered an indigenous racism not just simple xenophobia towards the unknown other from the East, but rejection of the internal other, in this case Roma, that live in the very centers of Hungarian life. And this is gonna lead me to comment briefly on the weaknesses of the EU brand of multiculturalism in this region, particularly as it was attached um, to incentive structures such as EU accession or funding for minority groups in the 20 years between 1989 and 2009. Uh, the next slide gives you Orban filtering that same disenchantment. He would say, multiculturalism has established parallel societies in Europe. However, this can put into question the pillars of European life's basic values. It's a little awkward, this translation. I'm very sorry. I just, it, it was a couple days ago and I just translated the tweet. So, he's 
claiming that multiculturalism is actually a perversion of what Europe stands for. And you'll find him very often referring back to this legalistic framework um, that the rule of law must be suspended, not recognizing that, in fact, um, I'm sorry, he, he argues that the rule of law must be upheld and that uh, these refugees are breaking the law, and that's why he has to take the actions he does. I would argue um, that the rule of law must, in fact, be suspended. Um, and in that case, we have to look beyond the legalistic framework to a humanitarian law. And in making statements like this, he claims to be standing in for the French Revolution. And the longer version of this quote is he brings up issues like uh, egalitarianism and um, trying to redistribute material resources. However, I would argue that Orban and Fides here are standing for an even older idea of Europe, long before the French Revolution, beyond the humanist cultural sphere. Remember that Europe meant fighting religious wars, defending borders, exploiting both foreign and local subjugated populations for material and cultural enrichment. This is why it's possible to defend Europe, meaning old Europe, and resist the relatively recent invention, reinvention, of Europe as a refuge of tolerance and multicultural values. So I don't want to leave you thinking that I'm against <laughs> reinventing Europe as a refuge for tolerance and multicultural values. So as a coda here, I want to give you a picture of how we did see humanism and humanitarianism in the region um, through some of the grassroots efforts that sprung up in the vacuum of government action here. Um, next slide. So I think these kinds of organizations got some coverage in the left-leaning Western press. Migration aid, um, let's help the refugees. These are relief organizations that sprung up entirely um, through civil society uh, pretty much in July. And you can see in the next two slides, I have a tattooed gentleman and um, someone wearing in the slide after that, the migration aid symbol. Uh, volunteers handing out things um, at, the, at the train stations at the borders. And for those of us that had started to lose our faith in, quote, actual existing civil society, unquote, as a force for effective action, this was a wake up call. These several dozen organizers and the several thousand volunteers who responded to this call did prevent a humanitarian disaster. And I'll give you some of the lesser known examples. Um, the next slide, Kalate Kamech Project, was a grassroots attempt to provide electricity and Wi-Fi access, things that not everybody thinks about right away, Kalate. And the next couple of slides shows uh, refugees trying to charge their cell phones. Um, there's after this a gentleman translating a sign about we free Wi-Fi. Uh, after this, a refugee successfully having charged his, his phone and getting online, and then a kind of a workaround makeshift, uh, very inventive, lo-fi solution to how to charge 20 cell phones at once. So this is just to give you some hope in uh, creativity and grassroots organizing in response to a crisis. Uh, can I have another minute, Fedora? Okay, so I wanna try to ask two questions about the media representation. The first is, what narrative does this image support? And I think Yana gave us a great example of images that only gave us one narrative. I gave you some examples of images that have a bifurcated uh, representative, set of responses. Um, we have to think not just about what the image is and what it represents initially, but how it can then be repurposed, co-opted, put into a meme, abused, disabused. Here's one. Next slide, please. We have an image of police standing with their backs to a train. Um, this is from August, and it was a widely circulating image here showing, to some, Hungarian strength in the face of crisis, Hungarian military strength, um, a police presence which keeps people on the right side of the line. And visually, you'll see we do have glimpses of people that are refugees, including this, I think the focal point of the image is probably the baby, which you can see through these um, different legs. But we are not given a true sense of what they're doing there, what they're about. All we know is that these police are there to make sure that they stay where they're supposed to be. Of course, for those on the opposition in Hungary, this is seen as a great example of the abuse of state power and the refusal to actually intervene and help. So it gets read both ways as a symbol of security and a symbol of abuse. Last image and my last point today. Um, this is a photo taken not by a French journalist,
journalist, but uh, by um, an artistic photographer who was trying, who was also there helping with the relief effort, volunteering. And he was trying to capture a scene which happened every night at Kelopsy in the last two weeks of August. Um, the gentleman in the white shirt all the way in the upper right corner is a member of the Hungarian creative class who just simply brought his laptop projector and showed cartoons for the kids every evening. I like this image because, as uh, Jana points out, we often just see children in a state of uh, physical need. Here they are just watching TV. And more than the children in the center, especially this one, the focal point is the guy, little kid wearing a white mask for no apparent reason. <laughs> we have a ring of teenagers, the ones demonized by practically every media representation, watching cartoons. So I'll just conclude by saying that um, I have a pretty strong personal stake in what happened this summer. I live about a half of a mile from Kelepsi, and because I'm not in an expat bubble here, I'm pretty deeply embedded in Hungarian society, I've had to hear some of the worst things that I've ever heard people say about those of other races and ethnicities outside of the United States of America. So I take a lot of heart in looking at images like this, both for the humanization of its subjects and for what it represents in terms of what civil society can achieve. Thank you.